three questions, similar topic. Um, in our current culture, what would you say are the primary thieves of our joy as it relates to pastoral ministry? And following that, how do you personally fight for joy when the pastoral load and demands of life are incessant and feel hard to focus on these joys? So what are the primary thieves? And then how do you personally I think the that? primary thieves are created less by the culture. And it's more by your personality. So I think there are different guys who have different kind of weaknesses. Um, you know, people say that we're very impatient now because... This is the age of the eye because we've got, you know, everything just visually in front of us all the time. I, I do think we have stuff visually in front of us, but I, I disagree that that's new. I think the age of the eye is what we are made in the image of God to desire. I think we're made to desire the immediate presence and visibility of God. I think ever since Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden and we were excluded from the visible presence of God, we have been by nature creatures who long for that visible seeing, that immediacy of knowledge, and we have been denied it. And this is now not the age of the eye, it is the age of the ear. We hear his promise, we believe what he says. It's, it's counterintuitive to our fallen selves. Yet the climax of the Bible, Revelation, Revelation 22, 4, they shall see God when we're restored to that immediacy. But there's nothing that comes with changing technology that affects that basic thing of who we are. We are made to crave the immediacy of sight and our knowledge, and we don't have it. So I would say that various, you're probably already going to know the answer to this question even before I try to give a general answer. You know the kinds of things that in the last 12 months have discouraged you. You know the, the things that you can tell when it's coming in conversation or about to come in the month or about to come in, in something your wife's saying. There's this certain just kind of thing like, oh, no, this is, I hope it doesn't go there. Oh, it went there. Mm. You know, and you know the kind of discouragement that can bring you. It's not always the same from guy to guy. Uh, it can be how your kids are doing, how your wife's doing. For some people, it can be a financial worry and a concern that they're not going to be able to provide for things they feel responsible to provide for. Uh, for others, it's going to be ashamed of various aspects of their church in front of brother pastors whose church is going better in this way or that way. Uh, for others, it could be very particular home, hopes that you've had. Uh, I know one brother who, though he pastored a church, his whole life seemed to be turned, chewed up or turned, taken up in this refugee work he had going on in Haiti. And if that wasn't going well, nothing mattered. It just, it varies from, from guy to guy. But I think you want to look and if you kind of can trace your own discouragement in the last six months, just ask yourself, what are the headwaters of that? Where did that come from? And then maybe get a, a good, knowledgeable friend or two to pray with you and help you explore what the roots of that kind of discouragement are. Self-awareness, self big part of that. Huge part of that. Um, so relatedly, how have you personally seen some of those thieves of joy change from different life seasons, from married, no kids, married with young kids, demands are different then, married with grown kids, empty nester. Have you seen those thieves change or they remain largely the same? Uh, it's going to be my nature to say they remain the same, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to be nicer than that. Um, I'm sure they appear in different guises. Mm -hmm. I do think essentially they must be basically the same, but it, it is very different. You know, your wife having three kids not yet at school at home and just about to pull her hair out and her not understanding that this is always for everybody the most difficult corner of life, of adult life. It just, yes, you're right. She doesn't find a lot of friendships at church. Yes, you're right. Her good friend left and she can't have time to replace him right now. Yes, you're right. I mean, just these are universal experiences. And you let the first kid get in you know, school and the second kid and the third kid and all of a sudden the whole world gets better. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's just... There's nothing wrong with that. It's completely understandable. It's just, it's a universal story. Um, and as you get older, a whole different thing is just challenges that come on with, uh, with planning for uh, the end of your career and worries uh, financially or what will you do or health problems, whether for you or your spouse, uh, you know, as you just realize, okay, we can't do that. Okay, that's now in the past. So there, 
every stage of life has its own challenges that are common to, to everyone. The question is, as Christians, are they revealing where our joys were? Or were our joys always in some other things that were more promised to us and more long-lasting? So I think what you and I want to do is cultivate our time with the Lord and the Word, trying to be faithful, believe Him in His promises, believe His priorities, lean into those things, pray for those things. Don't ignore and try to act like you're not a creature of flesh. If you're feeling particularly discouraged about some sickness that you find you have from a doctor's appointment, tell others that. But just don't be defined by that. Don't let that be the, the last or determinative thing about you as best you can. Are there any, I mean, you mentioned a number of them. You just gave us 11 uh, joys. Are there, anybody who's been in ministry any amount of time knows how it can just become a lot quickly. So, I mean, is there any, is there any other practice that you have aside of personal disciplines? Do you take a day a month to get out into the woods? Do you practice sabbatical? Do you have certain people that you call? Are there any go-tos that you found particularly meaningful? Uh, I, my church is very generous with sabbatical. Uh, I do have a good bit of sabbatical time. I don't take it all. They have to make me take my sabbatical. I use it as a verb. I say, oh, you're sabbaticaling me. <laughs> um, my assistant who's in charge of my schedule, strange how that works, um, they have to work two years ahead of time to get a, a sabbatical on my schedule. But, and I can see they've got one coming up, I think, in either the summer of 19 or 2020. And uh, I saw it at our meeting the other day, and I said, ah, I see I'm being sabbatical. You know, where, you know, as an extrovert, I kind of feel like you're casting me into the outer wilderness. You know, it's like, really? For six weeks, you want me just to hang around here and do nothing? I mean, read books and, you know, okay. All right. So, okay. yeah. It's helpful. No, it's probably not helpful. That's okay. Sorry, man. Mark is the most extroverted man I've ever met in my life. You should meet Max Stiles, pastor of the church in Erbil, Iraq, wrote several books on evangelism. That man, he's an evangelist and an extrovert that tires me out. <laughs> man, I probably don't want to meet him then. He's a wonderful <laughs> brother. You should have him do one of these sometime, actually. His book on uh, elders was great. Or no, uh, evangelism. evangelism. Yeah, yeah, so good. So a uh, good question here about uh, when ministry is difficult, as it can be, um, how do you discern whether you should stick with your original plan and or switch up what you're doing? How do you discern whether it's a difficulty, I guess, of your own making as opposed to this is just difficulty I'm facing for being faithful? Yeah. Uh, one, try to investigate theologically. You know, have I done something stupid, wrong, unbiblical? And if you're not guilty of that kind of principle violation, then you're down just to prudence and you just need counsel from others. So find those who know you well, certainly talk to your wife, uh, but find other elders in your church and other pastors from outside your church that know you well and say, hey, here's what I'm feeling, here's what I'm thinking. Do you have any counsel for me? There's wisdom in counsel. That's good. And that's one of the reasons you want good friends who are pastors. You don't want to wait till you need those friendships. Then it can feel almost too transactional, like I'm paying for a, you know, a counselor. It's not wrong to pay for a counselor. But friendships can do a lot of that work if you'll just go on and have those friendships, build those friendships. And, I, and I'll talk about this a little bit in the talk coming up. I find if you invest your heart in work beyond your own church, it's like diversifying your bonds, you know, and your stocks. It's just a really wise thing to do, you know, because Jesus says his church is going to win. That doesn't mean your church is going to win, but <laughs> his church is going to win. Yeah. So that's where we want to have our emotional money riding. Uh, not on our particular congregation. Mm. Mm. Another question here. Can Mark become my grandpa? I'm open to working out the logistics later. <laughs> I think you got this sweater going for it. More serious note here. This, you brought this up a number of times. Wait, wait, wait. I want to say, yeah. that's, I, I listened to the interview. Who was, who was interviewed during lunch? Rob. Rob, there. where are you? He's back there. Rob, what you said with your church about getting excited about the work in Ireland that Mark Smith is doing, that kind of advantage of Acts 29, that's exactly what I'm talking about. That's gonna be good for you spiritually, that's gonna be good for your church spiritually. And I would just say, that's the kind of concern you wanna have with other pastors within 30 miles of you that preach the gospel. You want your church to have concern for how those churches are doing. 
-hmm. So our church on a week ago, Sunday night, voted to give $20,000 to a church about seven miles from us that uh, is gonna have trouble paying for a good pastor, but we know they've got a potentially really good pastor who actually is from that church, but he's gone away and gotten seminary training. He wants to come back, but that church has just continued to shrink. They're not doing that well. And, uh, but they're gonna call him as pastor, uh, but they need money to pay him. And so our church voted to give you know, 20,000 of what's gonna be a tighter than normal year for us to them just kind of help them out because we want everybody on the team to win. Yeah. You mentioned membership a number of times today for good reason. Question here. We don't currently have clear membership. How do we work towards that and how long would that process typically take? So any, I know that's a big question. Yeah. Any practical? Yeah. Uh, the how long it takes depends hugely on your context. If you're in a situation where you or the previous pastor has probably taught against membership, well, then you're, it's going to take some time for you to kind of unpick that. Um, I, I would say that what you want to do first is make sure you teach very clearly what it means to be a Christian. Get that really clear. And then be really clear on what the gospel is. And be very, very clear on what a church is. And then you're kind of putting all the building blocks in place to then understand church membership. So I would just say, take a lot of time, teach. I'm just amazed how often Paul repeats the word patient or patience to Timothy when he's writing to Timothy. Uh, patiently teach. Get copies. I know when we wanted to move to elders, there wasn't much out on elders at the time. I think Strong's book may have just come out, but it's big. I grabbed John MacArthur's little 40-page booklet on shepherds or elders. I got like 80 copies of it. We only had like 160 members then. And I was just giving them out to everybody and getting them to pass them around and talk about them. And it was even useful that I didn't agree with everything in there. Because I could hand it saying, I don't agree with everything in there, but you know, I look at it. You know, I agreed with the basic stuff he was saying, but that got people reading it and talking about it. And I did that for months, maybe a couple of years, before I tried to then lead us to switch. You could do the same thing with membership. Um, you could get uh, one of Jonathan Lehman's little books, his little blue one, Church Membership which uh, one pastor in Lexington called me earlier this year. We call that in Lexington the blue magic. We say, have you given the blue magic out at your church? What's that? <laughs> this book on membership. <laughs> no, okay. So uh, that blue little ducks. blue book, or there's even a, a smaller one Jonathan wrote uh, for B&H called something like membership. Understanding church. Understanding church membership. That's even just 60 pages. But anyway, you get like 50 copies of those. Just start circulating among your church and don't have a time limit on the conversation. Don't put them under any pressure. Just let them think and understand and talk about it openly. Helpful. And then uh, last question. Just for anybody who's just super discouraged or feel like they've lost their joy yeah. in the ministry, any practical help or steps to start realigning their heart? How to get back to what you're describing here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, different brothers have different kind of personalities, mm -hmm. and John Piper is one who uh, is helped to have joy by studying what the Bible says about God and about joy, mm -hmm. and so his writings, I think, can be really helpful on this. I think uh, When I Don't Desire God mm -hmm. is a really good one to read, It is. and his book The Pleasures of God mm -hmm. is a really good one to read, and Jonathan Edwards' book Charity and Its Fruits, and especially that last sermon, Heaven is a World of Love. Oh, that's just so good. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Thanks, brother. Thank you. All right, let's take the next 15 minutes. We'll reconvene at uh, 2.15 for session number four.